Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, the call, call to worship passage comes to us from Psalm 42, verses 1 through 2. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 2. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Uh, in, in this passage, the psalmist deeply longs for God himself. And he says he longs for God as a deer pants for water, as a thirsty deer would, would pant for water. Uh, his soul is thirsting for God. And he says the, the way for this thirst to be quenched is by coming before God in public worship. As you come before him today, let me ask you, is there such a longing for God? Thirst and hunger for God? Uh, if not, as we, as we come before God, ask God, God, Give me a hunger and thirst for you. And as we gather today in worship, uh, pray that you would taste and see that the Lord is good as we come before His very presence. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, uh, we want to come hungering and thirsting for you, for more and more of you. Father God, we want our desires to be greater than a deer panting for a stream of water. May our soul thirst for you, O oh God. May we come and taste and see that, Lord, that you are good. And may our gathering each Sunday be a time where you show us yourself, reveal yourself to us. And we feast on more and more of you. Oh God, be exalted, be glorified as we worship you today. Pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's all rise for a time worship. God is my shepherd. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you are with me, you are with me. Shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Follow me in the house of God forever. house of God forever.
Your shepherd's staff. Your shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feet in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Follow me in the house of God forever. In the house of God forever. In the house of God forever. From the highest of heights, from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful. All powerful. Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? sun and give source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by Incomparable, incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God.
wrath completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus thank you Father, um, God, we want to come before you, God, and to give you praise and worship today, God, uh, for truly, God, you are um, the king above all kings, God. Um, your beauty, God, your majesty are indescribable, God. Um, you have created the whole universe, God, um, yet you care for, um, for us, God, for mankind who, God, we fall short so many times, God. Um, God, we fall in our sins, God, in the idol's on the temptations of this world, um, yet you would still send uh, down your son in love. Um, and God, we, in Christ, we just want to, to sing this song to you. Jesus, thank you for washing away all of our sins, um, that you would take on the Father's wrath uh, and that it would be placed upon you that we, and that we would be placed upon your righteousness um, that we could never earn on our own. So we want to to sing your praises that you will love us who was once your enemy, um, that you would still um, make the first move and send your son down to die for our sins. And so, God, we that's why we gather, God, and that's why we are in this place together as one body um, in Christ. And as we um, just go through the rest of service today, God, and as your servant, Pastor Joe, comes before you, delivers your your word today, God, your, your message of peace, God, may it give rest to our souls, God, um, on this Sabbath day. Um, so thank you once again for this time. And just now I pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Uh, as we come to our holy God, we confess our sins. And the confession of sin passage comes to us from Psalm 42, 11. We're actually in the same psalm uh, in which we talked about a deer panting uh, for the water and our soul panting for him. And you would almost expect that... Uh, the psalmist is going through a, a wonderful time period uh, in his life, but we see that he is struggling. Uh, he is suffering. That is, what, that is why twice in this short psalm, the psalmist tells us, as you read in verse 11, 
Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. You see, the, the psalmist is going through so much pain and suffering that he says in verse 2, My tears have been my food day and night. Can any of you identify with that? My tears have been food day and night. Even as he longs for God, as a deer pants for water, he's struggling. And while suffering, it is good and healthy to pour our soul to God like the psalmist does here. What does the psalmist do here? He pours out his anguish before God and he deals it before God in a very healthy way. However, uh, there are people who become bitter, people who lose their confidence and faith in God when they struggle with life. When you go down this path instead of path of faith, you could end up even judging God instead of putting your confidence and trust in God. Think about where you are in life. You know, life is full of pain, suffering. Are you becoming more and more bitter? Are you losing your confidence and faith in God? Then let's come before God and confess that we are doubting God and we're doubting His love and His goodness and confess our sin before God. And with the psalmist cry out, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Put your hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. May that be our testimony as we come before Him in repentance. Let's bow our head and confess our sins. The assurance of pardon passage comes to us from Philippians 4, 6-7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, as we come to you in prayer, because so often we're anxious, Father, we confess that we have tasted and seen that, that you are good, that you are loving. And yet, when we go through uh, pain, when we go through suffering, Father, we often doubt, we become bitter, lose confidence and faith in you. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Father, I pray as we draw near to you today, we would taste and see that, again, that you are good. And may we experience the peace that surpasses all understanding, only you can give. Father, minister to those who are in pain. Bring healing, but also bring faith and trust and confidence in you back. Father, draw us near to you. Help us to feast on Christ this day. May you, may you work through the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ to us today as we seek to glorify you and honor you. Be glorified, O God, we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Uh, let's say hello to one another as we dismiss our youth group students. <coughs> Good morning, everyone.
Good morning, everyone. Um, we're coming back to our series in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, in, in chapter 6, verses 9 through 15, Jesus, Jesus taught us how to pray uh, through what we call the Lord's Prayer. He taught us how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. Knowing our God as our Father in heaven, what do we pray for? First, for more and more of Him. Second, knowing Him as our Father in heaven, what do we pray? We pray and depend on Him more and more. In today's text, Jesus teaches us about fasting. That fasting is feasting. That fasting is feasting. And for this, we turn to Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Hear now the Word of God. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their face fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Word of God. Amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, <clears throat> may your spirit work through the word proclaim to show us who you are, that we would more, want more and more of you. Father, may you reveal more and more of you here and now. Reveal more and more of your son, Jesus Christ, as your word is proclaimed and help us to feast upon you. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. This past week, I was suffering from cold or flu, actually. And uh, I was thankful that I didn't get really sick until after I had done preaching on Sunday. So I was finished here. I went home on Sunday that evening. I got really, really sick. I was shivering and I had uh, high fever and uh, thank God for my wife who took care of me. Uh, before we left, uh, Changil said uh, to me, Pastor Joe, you should milk it and, you know, make her do all, all kinds of stuff for you. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, Changil. Uh, uh, and I told, I told him, my wife does everything for me anyway. Uh, but that evening, I had to, I was so sick that I couldn't even get my own medication. I said, can you get the cold medicine? I really had to milk it because I was so sick that evening. Uh, but uh, thank God I'm better. And you know what they say, you need to feed the cold, right? So that's what I've been doing all week. I've been feeding the cold, and you can probably see that, uh, <laughs> that I've gotten fatter as a result. Today's sermon, however, is about fasting. But I'm here to tell you that it is also about feasting because fasting is feasting. How many of you guys uh, have fasted before? Raise your hand. <coughs> okay. Yeah, a good number of you have fasted before. Um, maybe for, for religious reasons. Uh, others maybe um, have practiced the intermittent fasting, which was very popular and still somewhat is popular right now, I guess. Uh, the first time I fasted was because my older brother basically came to me and said, you're fat, you should fast. What an older brother. Uh, and I did, because I thought I was fat. The irony of it is uh, that I was not fat, but that my older brother was super skinny. He was 6'3", and 150 pounds. When he did jumping jacks, you could see his ribs. Skeletal. Right? How dare he call me fat when he was super skinny. Right? But I guess contrasted to him, <laughs> I was fat. And even more ironic is the fact that even as a pastor, my older brother is a pastor now in Dallas, he says that he can't fast because he has no fat reserve. He used to say this. And 
he says when he does fast, it's counterproductive because all he thinks about is food. And he can't think about anything else. He can't focus on prayer because all he thinks about when he fasts is food. So he doesn't fast. What an excuse. What a lame excuse, right? Jesus' sermon uh, about fasting is a part of what he began in verse 1 when he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You see, there were three signs of piety back then. Uh, Tokens of religious devotion. Giving to the needy, praying, and fasting. And Jesus is talking about these things and doing them before the audience of one. Right? Before one person, one God that matters instead of doing these things for other people. In this section, Jesus is dealing with fasting and telling us that fasting is feasting. Here's the main point of today's sermon. It is this. Because Jesus has transformed our hearts, we fast not to be seen by others, but to feast on God. In, number one, genuine repentance. Number two, in humble dependence. Number three, in spiritual sustenance. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, remember, I have been saying again and again that God is after your heart. Christ is after your hearts. Remember? And after transforming our hearts, our Heavenly Father wants us to give to the needy because we love Him. He wants us to pray because we love Him. And here, He wants us to fast because we love Him. Not because we want to be seen by other people. No. All these are in response to the amazing grace, amazing love that we have received. By the way, um, the Pharisees fasted twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. Remember that Pharisee who, who prayed at the temple and said, God, I fast twice a week. I tithe. I do all these things. I am not like that tax collector. Remember that Pharisee? What was he fasting for? What was he tithing for? To be seen by other people. But at the same place was a tax collector who beat his heart and said, forgive me, God, I am a sinner. What a, what a contrast. <clears throat> and some of these Pharisees would disfigure their faces, is what ESV says, that their faces may be noticed by others. There's a delicious wordplay going on here. Because the Greek term for disfigure, aphanizo, uh, could be translated hide or make unseen. So what were they doing? They were hiding their faces to be seen by others. They were making themselves unpresentable so that they would be noticed by other people. Maybe put ashes on their face. And, right? Stop putting makeup on. And make, you, make yourself feel miserable. Right? And let it be known to others. And Jesus says yet again of those people, they have received their reward. What is Jesus saying? That's the only reward that they're going to get, the praise of other people. And that's it. Is that what we want when we do our religious devotions to the Lord? However, Jesus says this. When you fast, first notice, he says, when you fast. What, what is the significance of that? Jesus assumes that kingdom disciples will fast. He spoke about when you give. He spoke about when you pray. And he speaks here about when you fast. He assumes that we will do that. And we should. And when we do, he says, anoint your head and wash your face. We are to fast before our Father in heaven. This is, this is all about him. And we're, we're, we're doing this because God sees in secret and he says he will reward you. Today, I want to help us know what proper fasting is. And and so, uh, I want us to feast on God because fasting is feasting. 
we feast on God, number one, in genuine repentance. We come to our first point. In the Old Testament and, and in the New, fasting was an expression of penitence for past sins. When people were deeply distressed over their sin and guilt, they would mourn and fast. They would fast and mourn and weep. For example, Nehemiah assembled the people, fasting and wearing sackcloth, and they stood and confessed their sin. They were, they were sent into exile because of their sin. And Nehemiah calls on his people to, to fast and to repent of their sins. And the people of Nineveh, remember the story of Jonah? He didn't want to go to Nineveh, but God made him go to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach, but God made him preach. Uh, you know, make some preachers feel bad because... You know, when we preach, some, you know, we don't see the, this greater effect. But when Jonah preached without wanting to preach, what happened? The whole Ninevites, the whole city repented. And what did they call for? They declared a fast and put on sackcloth. How about Daniel? Daniel sought God in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes. He prayed to the Lord, his God, and made confession for the sins of his people. What a godly man. He prayed for the sins of his people, repented of the sins of his own people. By the way, sackcloth uh, was a garment made of rough, coarsely made fabric and was a, as worn as a sign of mourning and penitence. It's very interesting that uh, in, in my mother country, we have these sackcloths, uh, very similar to that of the Jews. Right? When, when somebody passes away, we would also wear uh, a sackcloth. So we see this in the Old Testament, but we also see in the New Testament, in Acts 9, 9, we see Saul of Tarsus, which, whom we will call Paul later. Uh, after he's converted, what does he do? He's so moved to repentance for persecuting Christ and his church that he fasted for three days. He neither ate nor drank for three days. To fast is to humble ourselves before God. Yes, to humble ourselves. Uh, they are virtually equivalent terms. Equivalent terms. To fast and to humble ourselves are very much equivalent. And you first humble yourself to repent of your sins. And as you fast, God may reveal things that control you, things that you need to repent of. So you begin the fast because you want to repent, but as you, as you fast, guess what? Oftentimes, God reveals more and more things that control you, and you, you are moved to repent more and more. And it is no accident that Jesus talked about the blessedness of mourning as one of the Beatitudes, one of the blessings. Right? Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. What is the significance of that? Well, Jesus is after our hearts. And when we meet Jesus, He reveals that we are poor in spirit, spiritually bankrupt. He reveals that there is sin in us, that we, we need to repent of them, mourn over them. And we're moved to mourn over our sins. And then if we mourn, we're comforted. And when we come to God in uh, to God in fasting. <coughs> fasting. Let me read that again. When we come to God uh, in fasting, and when we come to God in genuine repentance, we are feasting on God and His in His mercy and forgiveness. We are feasting on God in His mercy and forgiveness. Isn't that beautiful? When we come to God in fasting, in repentance, we feast on God and His mercy and forgiveness. Of course, normal fasting is abstaining from food for a particular time. I, I read this cute story about how a five-year-old learned that uh, fasting means not eating food. And... Uh, uh, this kid's uh, parents were fasting, and the kid said to them, You're going to die if you fast. You're going to die. Um, and the father set the child, five-year-old child aside and said, 
No, no, listen. Uh, in the Old Testament, all these Old Testament saints fasted and prayed. And the kid said, and they all died. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's true. Uh, yes, in many ways, it is dying to ourselves. Uh, when we fast, we'll literally die unless you, you fast more than maybe 40 days. But we, and we come before God in fasting. Uh, we could fast food, abstain from food or other things as well. Uh, John Piper in A Hunger for God, it's a great book uh, that you could read on fasting, writes, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. I love that line. It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetites for heaven, but endless nibbling at a table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the primetime dribble of triviality we drink every night. All the Netflix movies that we see, all the Netflix shows that we watch. For all the ills that Satan can do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet of table of his love is a piece of land. Remember when, when Jesus invited, you know, gives this parable about inviting to a a banquet, what do people do? They give excuses. Oh, because of a land, because of ox, because of a wife, they don't come. The greatest adversary of love to God is not his enemies, listen to this, but his gifts. Isn't that interesting? Often our, our greatest enemy to feasting on God is his gifts because we love the gifts more than the giver of good gifts. We love creation more than the creator. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, John Piper says, but the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. Isn't that interesting? Think about it this way. You know, your spouse is cooking this delicious meal for you. And what you do throughout the day, you've been nibbling at the snacks. And so when you come to the main course, you say, I'm full, I don't want to eat it. When that's the most delicious food you should enjoy. And that's the picture that is being drawn here. When we prayerfully fast different things. For some people, it could be phones. It could be, you know, being on the web, or Facebook. Okay, Facebook is old, okay. Uh, uh, you know, Instagram, whatever. Right? Uh, God may reveal to us uh, good gifts that may have become our idols. Good things that are, may have become the ultimate things. Let's be honest, you know, we're approaching the Valentine's Day and so often we make a Valentine, uh, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our spouse, often to, into the ultimate things when God alone should have that place. Right? God alone should be in the place of being the ultimate one. In fact, in fasting, God may reveal how your own heart seeks to turn an act of humbling before God into something that exalts yourself. Isn't that an interesting point? Think about it. Fasting is an act of humbling ourselves before God. But our sin being what it is, we, we turn that, and we can turn that into an act of exalting ourselves. Uh, let me give you an example. You know, when, uh, when we used to have sign up for fasting, I purposely uh, deleted Sundays as a, one of the days for fasting. You know why? Because invariably, when you fast and come to church on Sunday, you're going to be what? You're going you're gonna to look miserable. You're going to act miserable and people are going to ask you, why, why are you so, uh, uh, so miserable? And you're going to be like, oh, because I'm fasting. And it becomes about, about bragging about the very thing that was meant to be humbling you. And that shows the state of our hearts, doesn't it? And that's what Jesus is pointing out here again. The Pharisees, in the very thing that should show themselves, humbling themselves before God, became an act a prideful act of you know, showing themselves off to the people around them. <clears throat> Fasting 
properly done is feasting on God in genuine repentance. Fasting is feasting on God in His mercy and forgiveness. As you fast, you're feasting on His mercy and forgiveness. Secondly, fasting is feasting on God in humble dependence. We come to our second point. Again, in the Old Testament and in the New, fasting was associated with praying for God's help. If fasting and repentance are coupled together in the Bible, fasting and prayer are coupled together even more. People fasted and prayed to seek God for some particular direction and blessing. They did so in humble dependence on God. Let me give you an example, examples from uh, the Old Testament. When a vast army of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meunites marched against Judah, King Jehoshaphat called on his people to fast and pray. Then he prays with them this great prayer, Our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless, listen to this, against this great horde. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a great prayer. But our eyes are on you. We need you desperately. That's why he calls on his people to pray and say, God alone can save and let's look up to God. Our eyes are on you. And what does God do? He grants them this great victory. They didn't have to do much of the fighting. As they, even, you know, as they were praising God that the enemy was destroyed, Esther is another example. Uh, before she risked her life by approaching uh, the king to tell him about Haman, who was planning to kill the Jews, she urged Mordecai to gather the Jews to fast for me, as she said. And of course, she and her maids fasted too. And as a result, who is killed? Haman is hung on the gallows which he built to kill Mordecai. How about Ezra? Ezra proclaimed the fast before leading the exiles back to Jerusalem that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey. What were they doing? They were depending on God. They, they recognized they need God's help as they did what God had called them to do. Uh, in the New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself fasted. You know, if, if you are saying, oh, we don't need to fast, uh, fasting is not for the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus, our Lord himself, fasted uh, immediately before his public ministry began. And the early church followed his example. The church at Antioch fasted and prayed before Paul and Barnabas were sent out as first missionaries, right? As in, on their first missionary journey. Then... Paul and Barnabas themselves fasted and prayed wherever they went when they were appointing elders in those churches that they planted. What were they doing? They were depending on God saying, God, we need you in this. When we choose our leaders, we need your help. We need you desperately. In 1863, President Lincoln designated April 30th as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. I don't think we carry on this tradition now. Let me read a, uh, a portion of what his proclamation uh, said on that occasion. Listen to this. It is the duty of nations as well as of men who own their dependence upon the overruling power of God. What does he say? We owe dependence on the overruling power of God. To confess their sins and transgression in humble sorrow. We need to confess our sins. Yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by history that the nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. So, <clears throat> President Lincoln leads 
our nation in a prayer of repentance for our sins. <clears throat> and what is the sin that he focuses on? Listen to this. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and pres pers uh, preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. What is the sin that he bemoans and repents of? Self-sufficiency. <clears throat> And then he goes on. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has grown. But we have forgotten God. <laughs> to pray that during that period of time. Compare that to now. My. We have forgotten God, haven't we? We have grown too self-sufficient. We do not turn to God in humble dependence on God. And again, it is no accident that Jesus talked about the blessedness of meekness in the Beatitudes. Jesus was after our hearts. Christ not only reveals the sin in our hearts, He also shows us that we need Him. We desperately need Him. In meekness, we have a true estimate of ourselves that we can't do anything of eternal value apart from Christ. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And when we fast and humbly depend on God in prayer, we feast on God in His power and His provisions. Let me say that again. We feast on God in His power and His provisions. Why do we not experience His power? Why do we not you know, know the nourishment and sustain, you know, sustaining power that comes from God because we have not prayed as we ought. In fasting, let me say, we experience the power of God which nourishes us and sustains us like King Jehoshaphat did. Right? The amazing victory was won because he totally, desperately depended on God. John Piper writes in, in A Hunger for God again that he's own serious condition of fasting as a spiritual discipline began as a result of uh, visiting Dr. Jun Gon Kim in Seoul, Korea. <coughs> uh, Dr. Piper asked Dr. Kim, is it true that you spent 40 days in fasting prior to the evangelism crusade in 1980? And uh, Dr. Kim said, yes, it is true. You see the you see, Dr. Kim was chairman of the crusade, expected to bring about a million people to Yoido Plaza in, in Korea. But six months before the meeting, the police informed him they were revoking the permission for the crusade. Korea at the time was in uh, political turmoil, and Seoul was under martial law. So what did Dr. Kim and his associate do? They went to the prayer mountain, fasted and prayed for 40 days. They came down, went to the police station, and one of the police station recognized Dr. Kim, went to him right away and said, Oh, Dr. Kim, we have changed our mind, and you can have your meeting. <clears throat> they experienced the power of God in fasting and prayer, in humble dependence upon him. And John Piper says, this gave him a serious consideration of fasting as a discipline that we need to, to reconsider. As a church, brothers and sisters, we should fast and pray as we face great battles. You know, I shared with you uh, about the book, uh, The Great Dechurching. We're facing historical number of people leaving Christian churches across this country. We're facing a great battle. Uh, we cannot just think, okay, we can go and do our businesses as usual. No, we need to humbly come before God and desperately depend on Him. And one of the ways in which we do that is fasting and prayer. Um, we need to pray and fast, fast and pray as we send out workers, missionaries into the world. You know, when one of the Couples that we sent out, uh, supported, um, got a divorce while serving uh, in the mission field. It broke my heart because you know why? We didn't pray for them. 
We didn't support them in prayer as we ought. And you know, one of the missionary couples uh, that we support currently openly said, we're struggling in our marriage. We need you to pray for us. Are we lifting them up in our prayers? As we choose our servant leaders, um, deacons, especially elders, uh, we need to go before God and say, God, we desperately need your wisdom in choosing elders. And you know what? Uh, we need to pray about choosing uh, future elders and deacons and deaconesses in our church. And as individuals, also you should fast and pray as you humbly depend on Him. In college, um, as I was struggling to find God's will for my life, I was praying about how pursuing medicine coincided with uh, seeking to become a minister of God's Word. I struggled uh, how the two can be reconciled together. And my father encouraged me to go to the prayer mountain and to fast. And so I did. I went to the prayer mountain, fasted for three days, and guess what? I was so weak, I did more sleeping than anything else. I was like lying in bed. I was like, oh, I have no energy. And, of course, there were people in, in the prayer mountain, not too many at the time, who were fasting and praying too. Uh, but I did pray. <clears throat> and I was convicted that, yes, this is the path that I should still pursue. And I came out uh, of that uh, time of fasting and prayer with the conviction that God is leading me, guiding me down that path. Let me ask you, what are some things that you need to fast and pray over? Uh, fasting has become no longer something that we do in many circles. But fasting is a wonderful way for us to, to feast on God in humble dependence. Fasting. Fasting uh, is feasting on God in His power and provisions. Fa finally, uh, fasting is feasting on God in spiritual sustenance. We come to our final point. In verse 17, Jesus says, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Of course, Jesus is telling us to wash and put lotion on as we normally do, put makeup on as we normally do, so that, you know, uh, people won't just notice you. Uh, then he go, continues, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So what is this idea of reward? What is the reward that Jesus is talking about? As we said before, when I preached on the earlier portions of Matthew 6, the reward is relational. The reward is relational. And we get a hint of this in the phrase, your Father who is in heaven, and the repeated references to, to your Father, your Father, your Father, your Father. Here we have, in this short chapter, more references to our filial father-child relationship than all of the Old Testament combined. And I said that's an astonishing thing. If you are seeking to feast on God through fasting, you'll be rewarded with more and more of God. That's the idea. What is a reward? More and more of God. Instead of aiming for some other reward, earthly rewards and others such, we're aiming for the satisfaction in God. And satisfaction in God itself is the greatest reward because God is our greatest reward. The reward comes in this life because this desire for satisfaction in God results in more and more knowledge of God and in our transformation and our fruitfulness. Remember what uh, my professor from seminary, Sinclair Ferguson, said about reward. This reward also will be f in the future as well will be rewarded according to the capacity we have expressed for His glory. Capacity we have expressed for satisfaction in His love in this life. And He says, when we go to heaven, not everybody will have the same reward, but we will not be jealous for it. right? But people will 
receive a greater reward according to the capacity of how they have sought to love God and glorify Him in this, in this life. And one of the things he also says is, you'll be surprised. It may not be the pastors who get the greatest rewards. It may be those who work behind the scenes, who pray in secret, who fast in secret, who do things you know, in secret, giving to the needy in secret, who do things unseen for the glory of God, who love God, are seeking to, to feast on Him. In uh, the book again, uh, Hunger for God, John Piper asked the question as he concludes the book. Why does God reward fasting? He answers this way and concludes the book. God rewards fasting because fasting expresses the cry of the heart that nothing on earth can satisfy our souls besides God. Let me read that again. God rewards fasting because fasting, listen, expresses the cry of the heart that nothing on this earth can satisfy our souls besides God. Do you believe that? Nothing on this earth can satisfy our souls besides God. And he goes on to say, God must reward this cry because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Very, very John Piper-esque, right? In Deuteronomy 8.3, God tells the Israelites that He humbled them, causing them to hunger. In fact, God, God made them fast and then He fed them with manna to do what? To teach them. Man does not live alone. But man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That we do not live alone by bread, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Richard J. Foster, another great book entitled Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth, writes this. Fasting reminds us that we are sustained by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Food does not sustain us. God sustains us. In Christ, all things hold together. Therefore, in experiences of fasting, we are not so much abstaining from food as we are feasting on the word of God. Fasting is feasting. Let me give credit where credit is due. I got, I got the title from him, okay? Richard Foster. Then he goes on to write about Matthew 6. We're told not to act miserable when fasting because in point of fact, we're not miserable. We are feeding on God. And just like the Israelites who were sustained in the wilderness by the miraculous manna from heaven, so we are sustained by the Word of God. What are we doing when we come and fast? We're feasting on God we're feasting on the gospel of God's grace and love. We're feasting on God's gospel of grace and love. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. How many of you guys are cheering for San Francisco? Raise your hand. Wow, that's it? Okay. How many of you are cheering for Chiefs? Okay, just a very, very... How many of you couldn't care less? Wow. Wow, most of you couldn't care less. Okay. But let's care just a little bit, okay? Uh, a little bit as we talk about San Francisco. Um, on San Francisco side, um, there's an outspoken Christian player uh, by the name of Brock Purdy. Uh, he's their quarterback. In one of the interviews with Sports Spectrum, which is a Christian ministry, he said that Psalm 23 has been a great source of strength this year for him. He quoted it as, the Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. Uh, I don't know which version that is, but that's a good translation because some translations say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And some people think, oh, you don't want the Lord as your shepherd? <laughs> right? The idea is, I have what I need, and I'll, I'll check, I'll, I, will, I shall lack nothing, is the idea. And, and Purdy said that, and he went on to say that uh, 
It's tempting to get all wrapped up in wanting to be loved by his teammates, the fans, and everybody in the world. But he said that uh, Psalm 23 tells him that I already have what I need from the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you want to cheer for San Francisco like me today? Uh, by the way, when, uh, when the Ravens, my hometown team, were playing uh, Houston Texans, I was torn a little bit because the most outspoken player during that game was Stroud, the quarterback, young quarterback from Texans. And he would glorify, you know, give glory to God in everything and thank God. And even in loss, he would you know, thank God. And, and I was thinking, what would give God more glory? I was cheering for Baltimore, but I was torn because I was thinking maybe Texans winning would give God more glory. So, so I was thinking, how should I pray? Uh, but I said to God, I still like Baltimore. Please help Baltimore win. But uh, after Baltimore won, uh, the thing that became big was how Lamar Jackson prayed before for the game. And he gave glory to God that way. So I was like, yes, not only did Baltimore win, we gave glory to God. But anyway. I, I am, I'm getting straight by my own example. Um, fasting reminds us, here's, uh, we need to go back, that the reward we seek is God. What we, need, what we seek is God. This Wednesday uh, is also Valentine's Day. You know, I mean, not only is it Super Bowl Sunday, this Wednesday is Valentine's Day. And it's a day that makes many people feel miserable because you don't have a Valentine. And I've been there with you uh, for many, 25 years of my life, so I can identify with you. Um, but what the Bible tells us is, and what, what this is pointing out is, the Valentine you need, the love that you seek, is found in God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not in, in the girlfriend, not in the spouse, who can even become your idol. No, the love you seek is found in God. Fasting is feasting in spiritual sustenance because, because you're feasting on the grace and love of Jesus Christ as you come to fast and feast on God. <clears throat> Today, uh, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. We're going to go right into the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And I purposely wanted to, you know, celebrate the Lord's Supper with this message. The Lord's Supper is a feast of the soul. Did you know that? The Lord's Supper is a feast of your soul because... We're feasting upon Christ and the benefits for which He has secured for us by His death on the cross. As we come hungry, and we're going to sing that song entitled Hungry, we're feasting on His mercy, love, and grace. And I hope that every time you come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, it is not just another thing, you know, you eat the bread and you go through the motions. No, no, no. Allow God to minister to you. This is what we call means of grace, where He pours His grace to you. It is also fellowship with Him and with one another here because you know why? He is here with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In John 6.35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The core emptiness, hunger and thirst is met in Christ and Christ alone is what we're being told. And it will be truly satisfying. Christ is the main thing, the ultimate thing that we seek. And what Jesus demands of us is faith in Him. Then He says in John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me has eternal life. And so to all who believe in Him, what He offers is a saving relationship through Him. 
What he offers is a saving relationship through Jesus Christ. Then he says in John 6, 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, you have no life in you. No wonder, no wonder uh, people in the Roman Empire thought that you know, Christians were carnivores who, or carnivals who, who uh, ate uh, the flesh and drank literally blood of people, right? And no, no, no. Jesus is saying eating and drinking are metaphors of faith. Jesus' body was pierced and broken on the cross for us. And he shed his blood, died, and died on the cross to forgive you and me of his sins. And so as we come, as you come, come in faith and feast on Christ. And as you come, come hungry, knowing that as you partake of the bread and the wine, you're partaking of the bread of life, Jesus himself. Fasting teaches us to be hungry for the right thing, the ultimate thing, Jesus, for God. It is no accident, again, Jesus talked about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And we said, the righteousness that we hunger and thirst for is Christ himself who is the source of our righteousness. And I pray, brothers and sisters, as you come, that you would hunger and thirst for more and more of him. And then as you come and partake, that it would be a feasting of your soul and you, that you would experience his mercy, forgiveness, grace and love. Let's pray. And we'll go right into the celebration of Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice your only Son on the cross. We ask that as we partake, we would indeed receive the benefits for which you have instituted in this holy sacrament, that it would be a feast of our soul as we feast on Christ, that it would be a fellowship with Christ and with one another here because Jesus Christ is here present with us. Father, open our eyes to see Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let me explain to you how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to ask uh, you to come down this way, um, partake, and then go back to your seats. And then we're going to partake together as a family. Okay? And this table is uh, for the family. Uh, by that, what I mean is those who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, those who have, who have been baptized uh, as adults, made that public confession of faith, and for those who have been infant baptized, for those who are confirmed. The reason why we do this is not to, not to limit you from coming and being blessed. That's not what we are, what we are about. We do this because if you do not recognize the body and the blood properly, you drink and eat judgment unto yourself. That's what Paul tells us, and we don't want you to do that. In fact, we want to encourage you, take the necessary step, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, to be baptized. And if you've been infant baptized, not confirmed, be confirmed. In fact, we're going to be going through those, having those classes soon. Sign up for those things so that you can partake. But even, even though you may not be able to partake today, right, eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you can see visibly Christ represented in the, in the blood, uh, Christ represented in the bread and the wine, and worship with us, seek the Lord with us, and, and feast on Him participate with us 
actively. Feast on Him and ask the Lord to reveal Christ more and more to you now, even though you may not be able to partake. We're going to be singing uh, this song, Hungry, I Come to You, for I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. And uh, as we sing this song, I invite you to stand. Let's all stand <coughs> and come forward and go back to your seat and we'll partake together. I run. film and uh, take the bread our Lord Jesus Christ our Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it gave it to disciples and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me let us partake together In the same manner, he also took the cup. Let's uh, move the next film. After giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for forgiveness of sins. 
Drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your rich mercy and invaluable goodness bestowed to us in this sacred communion. Father, thank you for the reminder that as we partake, that we are feasting on Christ, that this is a feast of our soul. Nourish our soul. Nourish us. Father, we need that nourishing. And we pray, Father God, that uh, as we partake, we will do so as a, a fellowship of brothers and sisters who love one another. Help us to be mindful of one another. And Father, draw us closer and closer to you. May our longing be for more and more of you. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Now it's time for offering. And uh, you can give online and you can give um, in the box in the back in person. And the reason why we give is because we're responding to the love that has been uh, showered upon us. Uh, we give in response to the grace uh, that has been poured upon us. And uh, for our offering, uh, David will come and pray on behalf of the church. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for all that you have given us. At this time, please help us to be aware of all that you have done for us. And then uh, when we pray, when we fast, let us do it for the right reasons. That we do it for, for you only and for no one else. Please help us not to um, distort things for our own benefit, as we are prone to do. It is very tempting in this world to just do things for ourselves, to lift ourselves up rather than to lift you up. I pray that uh, with everything that we do as believers in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we do things for you as Jesus did, as he sacrificed himself for all of us, we follow his example and serve you as well. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to lift up uh, Thomas and Anna, our, our missionary over in Tijuana, that as they have uh, shown through their lives and their willingness to serve their community uh, in Tijuana, uh, please uh, give them strength and, and perseverance and um, guidance in their mission there. And then uh, to set a good example for all. For all of us, for all uh, as we uh, try to uh, serve you in our lives as well, I thank you for your 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 gifts and all that you do for us. I pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, it's now time for greetings and announcements. We have uh, our welcoming committee member there, uh, standing there to greet you, to welcome you. So if this is your first time visiting us, please. Please uh, see her, and she can, uh, uh, you know, can explain to you what our church is about, and uh, answer any questions you may have. And it's a first step uh, towards joining our Hope family as a member. Again, welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. Next, uh, we have what we call reflection time. This is very unique to our church, and uh, we said last week that uh, we want to be a church where people find their belonging. And this is one of the, one of the strategies we have uh, instituted many, many years ago to implement that. And 
uh, you will notice a little bit of difference uh, in the format uh, up there because we put uh, tag and yak together to, to show that yeah, we are asking uh, more and more uh, taggers to participate, which means the adult group, the married couple and all the singles to participate so that you can get to know the younger people in our ministry and fellowship with them. Uh, the reflection group is not just for college nor for young adult group. It's for everybody. You know, uh, during COVID, we have gone away um, from making it uh, for everybody. We have excused uh, taggers uh, to move away from participating, but uh, we're slowly but surely asking that all of us make an effort to get to know each other um, in this way. Uh, we want to ask you to please meet promptly at 12.15 in the respective rooms or areas. And once a month, there's also a family reflection, com family combined reflection to encourage that we get to know everybody, right? College, Tag, Yagwood, um, uh, gather the first Sunday of every month so that we get to know each other in this church. And as I said to you, it's not a, great, it's not a very big church. Uh, if we make an effort, we can all get to know one another, right? Uh, so I want to encourage you guys to, to participate. And if you would like to be a leader, uh, uh, they are looking for leaders for Reflection Group. Uh, please contact uh, David Myung, uh, my son. Uh, he's uh, taking the lead on this. So please uh, speak to him. Okay, next. <coughs> As I mentioned, those of you who couldn't participate in the Lord's Supper because you have not been baptized or you have not uh, been confirmed if you're infant baptized, please uh, take this opportunity. Uh, we're going to start the class soon and go into to March, and you're going to be baptized or confirmed on the Easter Sunday. What a, what a wonderful way to celebrate Easter. So please come and speak to me. Um, in fact, better yet, uh, there are sign-up sheets that will be uh, posted on Facebook groups on Monday. Uh, if you're not part of that Facebook, you can come speak to me and we'll sign you up. Next. Uh, for youth parents, uh, there's going to be a parent-teacher meeting next Sunday after the service at 12.15. So please uh, stick around um, so that Jonathan can get to know you, meet with you, uh, tell you what is going on in the youth group and, and uh, you know, answer any questions you may about what's coming up as well. Okay, next. Uh, women of Hope, Soul to Soul, a woman seeking opportunity to fellowship with one another. Uh, this is continuing. And, you know, again, this theme of us wanting to get to know each other, this is another great way uh, to get to know the sisters of our church. And f uh, so details um, are on Facebook, Discord, sign up. And uh, please contact Gina if you have any questions. Next. We have uh, started and we continue to pray here together in person. So please join us for prayer. Next. Uh, thanks again for um, giving in the year 2023. Uh, you can get, get a uh, tax contribution letter uh, from our finance team by emailing um, that, using that email address. Next. Okay. Uh, let's all stand for the doxology. Brothers and sisters, let us praise God from all our hearts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Receive the blessings from the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, everyone, go in, go in peace. Uh, there is uh, snacks outside, Valentine's Day snacks outside, so enjoy it. <laughs>